So before I went to med school, I was doing research at the Nas National Institutes of Health and um, in Building 10, which is the clinical center. So I was on the basic science side, and then on the other side of the building were the patients. And I think I knew I always wanted to be a doctor, so I would, you know, go over there and talk to the patients or go to the talks about what was going on with the patients. And um, just for the students who are watching it, NIH is a place where people go when all of the uh, conventional treatment hasn't worked. So usually chronic illness, um, um, pretty severe chronic illness. People are coming for that last hope to have something work to alleviate their symptoms or to help them. So um, I was working in the Arthritis Institute, and so a lot of the people, uh, the patients that I was interacting with had um, arthritis, lupus, other types of autoimmune diseases. And it was interesting to me how at, at the grand rounds or at the talks, they were described as pretty end stage or hopeless or words like that. And we're here, you know, it was, it was a well meant, you know, we're here to try these innovative medications. But yeah, when I talked to the patients, they didn't strike me that way at all. I mean, they were, they had full of meaning in their lives. And I just remember one person who was an artist and their hands were so gnarled that they couldn't do art anymore. But they had figured out another way through taping, through other, other ways to be creative. And it just struck me a lot that their inner life, their spirituality was really important to a lot of people. So I then went to medical school and I was amazed that we didn't even have any humanities class. It was all science. Um, and and um, in the psychiatry classes, we talked about you know, medications to treat depression, but nobody really talked about meaning and purpose. And what about that inner aspect of healing that people have? So that really inspired me to develop an elective, which we did. And then eventually that became required at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. What was the elective? How did it was work? in spirituality and health. Okay, it was. And it was, yeah, yeah. And we um, covered. We had research that was going on. Dave Larson, who was one of my earliest mentors, and who unfortunately died when he was in his mid fifties, mm -hmm. um, was one of our speakers, and that's how I got to know him. And then a couple of years later, I actually worked with him while I was a resident. Uh, it, running his education division, and that's how we developed the whole curricular programs in spirituality and health. Mm -hmm. um, we had gotten funding from the John Templeton Foundation and then developed a grant program so medical schools could apply for a grant to do a course on spirituality and health. And um, we, we ran that grant from, let's see, I think 1996, 1997 until 2004, so a long time. And over the years, many of the medical schools around the country applied for that. And what fascinated me was that even the schools that did not get the grant, because we could only offer a small number, still went on to have courses. So that was a, a huge piece of, of uh, I think, developing education, spirituality, and health. And then eventually, more recently, uh, in 2009, we brought, um, th again, through a competitive process, seven schools together to develop competencies and behaviors and spirituality and health. So quite a change from, you know, the elective in 1992 to then competencies that were done with, uh, along with the WAMC has been published in their journal, Academic Medicine, this past year uh, in the field. Wow. You know, that's relatively fast for a sea change kind of thing. That's that's an interesting way you ask that question, a sea change. I think there's a sea change occurring. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's yet a complete <laughs> sea change. So yeah. we, I, don't want, I, I want the students to know that they're part of the early wave still. You know, there was a first wave. They may be in the second or third wave. But, but it's, it's, really, uh, it's very exciting to me because to, see, uh, to think about the early courses and when there was such pushback, uh, you know, what do you mean by spirituality? I hope it's not just religion, you know, and, and so broadly defining spirituality, meaning, purpose, and connectedness to the significant or sacred, however people understand that, has been really key in, I think, the successes of the courses. And then also uh, relating it to other movements, or other movements besides ours, uh, the humanities movements, humanities and medicine movement, trying to humanize uh, clinicians and mm -hmm. uh, trying to um, look at whole person care, palliative care, which you know also is my one of my clinical specialties. But looking at the biopsychosocial spiritual model as a way to frame what's going on with the patient, both in assessment and treatment, and in understanding their story. So there were it wasn't just arts. There's lots of movements that were occurring, and they just happened to dovetail. But I think what's unique about spirituality and health is that people are. Um, it's
it's still a, a word that raises some questions. And I suspect it's because it also means we need to look at what that means in our own lives. And sometimes that's not that easy. So um, it's, it's very important, I think, to, to keep this field labeled as spirituality and health. I think it's a, we offer a unique perspective to the whole person model. What would you say at this point are the most significant accomplishments in the field? What are the things you feel the best about? And in talking about that, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the global network that's sure. yeah. starting to emerge. So significant accomplishments. Well, I mentioned the courses, and I think um, having the majority of medical schools teach topics related to spirituality and health is really important. We also at GW started our spirituality um, and health course as a vertically integrated curriculum, so it starts in the first year, it moves on to the second, third, and fourth year, and then it, you know, ideally into residency and fellowship too, so each building on, on the earlier topics. I think that's a... Um, and and I, uh, most of our schools now do something like that. So at GW, we have a living with dying thread that was part of our spirituality curriculum. So it starts with, you know, the service of remembrance for the medical students to thank the donors for donating their bodies and the families who come to the service. They have a reflections on, on gross anatomy. Then it moves into breaking bad news and other things that are more clinically relevant as the, as the years advance in medical school. So um, those models, I think, have been markers of success. The fact that the majority of schools have, medical schools have courses. The fact that now we've been working with interdisciplinary uh, programs as well. Nursing in their um, baccalaureate of nursing requirements, which was, I believe, in also around 2009, maybe it was 2008, they added back spirituality into their required curriculum. Even though nursing had that many, many years ago in their curriculum, uh, like medicine, they moved away for more scientific base. So um, there are many markers like that. Uh, a big marker is our first textbook in spirituality and health. And what was exciting was the interprofessional aspect and the international aspect. So the first editor is Mark Cobb. He's a chaplain in England. I'm a physician here in the U.S. And then Bruce Rumble is a public health expert in Australia. And all of our authors come from different countries and different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So to have theologians, um, all the disciplines in healthcare uh, participate. I think uh, religious studies, uh, culture, philosophy, atheists, agnostics, I mean, to have the whole gamut of, of people and, and their discipline perspectives from their different disciplines as well as their religious and or cultural backgrounds, I think was really important in that textbook. Um, and that's through Oxford University Press and a paperback version is coming out. Oh, that's it's a little pricey. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. a great book. It's a great book, I think. Yeah, I got my copy finally. Yeah, and so having that really having many disciplines work together because this is a field where um, I think including ethicists, theologians, philosophers, as well as all the health disciplines is, is crucially important. This is not something that just belongs in medicine, obviously. This is something, and in chaplaincy, you know, we have chaplain leaders in this book. Uh, and to recognize chaplains as members of the healthcare team, I think, has been uh, probably one of the most crucial accomplishments. Uh, when I first started in this field, nobody really knew what chaplains did. And many people thought they were just clergy who did religious care. Um, and one of, I, I think one of the things that we at the George Washington Institute for Spirituality did is to really work very closely with chaplains. And to, um, to I, what I did is to highlight to my medical colleagues that these are professionals that we should work with. And so I remember in the 90s doing a grand rounds with a chaplain and myself um, presenting a case and the residents were just blown away at the different perspectives and how great chaplains are in, in medical care. Mm -hmm. Spirituality is part of medical care. So the referrals to chaplains went way up, you know. So I think um, um, that those, so the, the courses being required, the textbook was a major accomplishment. Uh, chaplains clearly uh, front and center in spiritual care and, and being such an important part of how we deliver spiritual care. Um, and then the, the other accomplishments were the model that was developed through a consensus process. We at GWISH uh, participated and co-led a number of consensus conferences and the first one was in 2009 with Dr. Betty Farrell, a nurse out of City of Hope and a leader in end of life, um, quality of, of life research. She and I brought together experts in palliative care, in theology, in 
different religious perspectives, all the healthcare disciplines. And together we developed a model of implementation where, where do we address spirituality, who does it? So we talked about spiritual screening, spiritual history, spiritual assessment, which is what chaplains do. The role of the non-chaplain clinician versus the chaplain clinician. So the non-chaplain clinicians are the generalists in spiritual care. We can provide compassionate care. We can um, address, do a screening or history. And then the specialists are the certified, the trained chaplains that do a full assessment and that work with us on the team to help treat spiritual distress, help identify, treat, diagnose spiritual distress. Um, and made a lot of recommendations in that conference as to how to implement it. What does it mean to work on a team together? How do we respect each other as equal members of a team? Um, what kind of research do we do? And for people who do quality improvement, make sure there's a question about spirituality and quality improvement as well. So that's been a, a big accomplishment. Um, there were two other conferences that we did uh, in the United States, um, co-funded by the Arthur Vining Davis uh, Foundation, where we brought more policy-oriented leaders. And in that group, we developed potential standards of care for compassionate care that's based on spirituality and health. So our model is that spirituality can lead to the practice of compassion. And that's our, if you will, a little specialty, if you want to call it, because compassionate care is huge. But, but our, our focus was on how spirituality can lead to that. Mm -hmm. So we developed potential standards of care and then recommendations within clinical care research, policy, education, community engagement, communication, I think I got it all, uh, six domains, uh, recommendations of how one might go about to implement these standards and finalize them. And then we had funding and, and did this uh, collaboratively with the Fetzer Institute to do this in the international setting, and that was in Geneva last January, in January 2013. And um, there we invited leaders from all over the world who have an interest or do work in spirituality and health. And that, to me, was an amazing conference because I didn't realize, first of all, how much work was, was going on. So talk about a sea change. Maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's a little further than I thought, but a lot of people uh, around the world doing work in this, research, education, clinical models, all over. And the passion that people have uh, to recognize that if we fully integrate spirituality into health, and health into health systems all over, that our care will be better, our patients will receive better care, our care will be more compassionate, our healthcare professionals won't be as burned out because we'll be working out of our call. So that was a very, um, for me, um, inspirational conference and very humbling to see how much work people are doing, even with small amounts of resources around the world, mm -hmm. how much is happening. Um, and, and then the, uh, the other important part of that is, is that um, not with us, but healthcare chaplaincy um, got a grant to, from Templeton Foundation to train chaplains in doing research. And that was really directly following that 2009 initial consensus conference that called for research. And many of us said chaplains should be doing this research. And so healthcare chaplaincy and George Hanzo, who's a, a very good friend of mine and a colleague, led that program to engage chaplains in research and, and have them be part of the medical team, not just in providing care, but also in coming up with research questions. And I think that's where the field is going now. What's the kind of research we need to do? Um, and, and how can we retain both the mystery of spirituality and health in our encounters with patients and yet develop an evidence base? That's a challenge, but how do, how do we retain um, what some people call the softer part of spirituality, which I think may be the most essential? the relationship-centered care. What does it mean to really be present to another person in the midst of their suffering? What does it mean to listen to their inner story? Some of that may not be totally amenable to clinically controlled trials, but I think we can do research. I think we can do research in this area, um, maybe use different methodologies, maybe more qualitative, the narrative, to really further show the importance. We all know that this is important, but I think it's important to document that. And so our, our, our conference in Geneva, again, also, we asked them to look at potential standards of care and methods of, of possibly implementing. And what I was struck by was how similar those were to the U.S.-based conference. And that's where both groups said we need a global network. 
uh, and that's where we are right now. We're mm -hmm. um, developing a global network in spirituality and health to um, connect people to resources, maybe go for funding together, to look at projects, to share ideas, uh, to look at shared educational models. Uh, I think when we look at education moving forward, in our country it's exciting to do interdisciplinary, but what if we think about even global programs that we can do together? Um, think particularly so many things are going online. How might we teach spirituality and health here um, with, say, a school in England or in Australia and start thinking uh, about models that cross culture, not just disciplines, I think could be really exciting for the future. Definitely. What advice would you give to people who are just starting out in the field? They're, you know, they get that sense that this might be something that they'd like to pursue and they're kind of getting their feelers out and they're just getting started. What would you tell them to do to get grounded and, and involved and know where they were headed? Well, so that's uh, people getting into the field. That's so many disciplines doing that. So right. for clinicians who want to focus mostly on practice, I would say uh, be aware of these models, um, integrate spirituality as an equal part of the domain and patient care. Um, do not get sidetracked by the pressures right now in healthcare, which are enormous. Um, don't get sidetracked by people that say, you know, we need to move people through quickly and then only focus on the physical because we think there's not enough time. This actually will save time because we can form better relationships, trust can build, and we can actually get more of the, quote, physical information that we need to help the patients. So I think it's very important that we always hold that whole person model ahead of us. And also that we should push back. I mean, we shouldn't just say, well, this is healthcare, so now we have to see patients every seven minutes. I think we should push back and say, this isn't working. This isn't in the best interest of my patient. And so how do we push back? Well, we can push back through advocacy, going to the Hill, going to our local Congress people, you know, local government representatives, um, you know, uh, really bring stories out on television, patient stories, saying that these, these models don't work. That's one way. Another way is research. So this is for the clinicians who do research or for the doctoral students that are looking at this or, or master's students looking at research. Well, what research is it to make that argument? What do we need to make the argument to the people on the hill, so to speak, uh, to say we need more than seven minutes? And, you know, I, I think of my colleagues in England were down this path many, many years ago, and they were seeing patients every five minutes, the primary care physicians. Well, England changed that. They realized it, it didn't work. So we should be also looking at other countries that have done something similar where they're saying we need more than five minutes. And what are they doing? What did they do to make that happen? What can we do to make that happen? So what kinds of research? I think the interdisciplinary dialogue is really important here to sit down with people who have MBAs in a business school and say, what are sustainable models? If we tell you that we need to have a little more time to see our patients, that taking a spiritual history is really important, that attending to psychosocial spiritual needs is just as important and maybe more important sometimes than physical needs. And this is what we need to do. Ask our business colleagues, well, let's come up with the right kinds of questions so that it's not just about the bottom line of saving cost, but it's also about what, what would be the cost to the system if we don't address spiritual suffering, if we don't address psychosocial suffering. What would be the cost then to the person, to their health, uh, to patient satisfaction? If you're looking at healthcare systems that want to have a good reputation and build more patients and have patients be attracted to their system, this could, this could do that. Well, patients love this kind of care, so highlight those stories, do research around that area. I think that's important. Another piece in research is to come up with a creative way, and this, this, is, this is a little out of the box, but I think we should bring physicists and others into the dialogue, because they look at other kinds of theories of you know, distance healing, distance interactions, emergence. There's other types of theories in other disciplines that may help us think of really creative ways to do research. Right now, we're just talking narrative, qualitative, quantitative, clinical controlled trials, but there may be other types of research that can begin to look at what is healing all about. And for those of us that recognize that healing can occur in the context of a relationship, so how do you measure that? 
you know, and I think bringing in other disciplines into that dialogue would be really important. So graduate students in physics, in business, in public health, and social work, you know, in health sciences, and allied health, all of those graduate students coming together to think about creative ways. Very exciting. I think it's, it is the wave of the future here in this field. Mm -hmm. And then education, of course, thinking of creative models, the certificate pro program is enormous. It's such a, a, a model where other schools can follow this model of your certificate program um, here at Western Michigan. And I think having those kinds of models where spirituality and health is accessible is, is described in scholarly as well as clinically relevant terms is important. Great. Um, did you have a case you might want to talk about or two or mm -hmm. an example uh, that might see. help the students get a little more sense of the flow maybe of how a spiritual history works or yeah. let me think of one okay because you know I can't tell you an exact case I, I have know. to modify <laughs> it a lot <laughs> so I'll think of one well I think um, let me do two cases because I want to bring up one that's um, religious and one that is not religious I think that's really important so um, so this is a patient who is a scientist and she's um, coming in for a physical and um, she's concerned because she's felt a breast lump and so um, we're doing a history she's a brand new patient to me never seen her before she's you know I'm on the list of her provider so she comes to see me so we do a we do a complete you know, I, I introduce myself to her, she introduced herself to me. We talk about the usual things that we do for a history. First, a little bit just more how are you doing, what are you concerned about. She tells me about the breast lump and would I please be sure to examine that, that she's concerned about that. Um, we talk, I go through the whole ritual of the, the history, the past medical history, the family history, allergies, medications. And then we get to the social history. And so in the social history, I would ask her, about her relationships. So in her case, she was um, married. She had a child um, who was in high school. She um, was happily married. Uh, we did a sexual history. She was sexually active with her husband. It was a strong relationship, monogamous. Um, and she loved her work, felt she was making a difference in her work. That was important to her. I asked her about exercise. She is potty with exercise, but she does it whenever she can, has a treadmill in the house and uses that. Um, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't drink, she doesn't use drugs. Um, and, um, and then I asked her, do you, know, do you have any spiritual beliefs or are you a spiritual person? And she says, yeah, I, I guess I am. Um, it's not exactly a word I would describe it. And she goes, what do you mean by spiritual? So I said, well, what does it mean to you? And so she said, well, I, I, really, um, I really love nature. Nature is really important to me. That's where um, you know, I find my peace. Um, I love, I, it's very important for me to do good things for people. That's my research is targeted around trying to find a cure, and that's important to me. But I ground myself in, in nature. I walk, I hike, I, um, I live near the woods, so I'm able to look out over the woods. And, um, and we had a lovely conversation about that and what that meant to her. Um, so then I, so that's the F part of the tool, FICA. Then I, I said, it, this sounds, you know, important to you. And she was absolutely important. If I don't, if I do not sit on, you know, in the nice weather, I can sit on the porch, drink coffee, and look at the woods. But if I don't have that moment before I go to work, you know, it's really, really hard. And then I said, well, are your, is there anything about your beliefs that will impact your health care decision making or how you care for yourself? So she said, I tend to not like to take medications. I'm very nervous about this biopsy. I don't even like anesthesia. You know, I want to know more about that. And then she said, you know, I know this is kind of down the line, but I'm a big supporter of hospice and um, you know this is one of those things that for my end of life I'm in a hospice I would want a hospice with a window that looked out over trees and can you jot that down in the note and I remember thinking because I didn't think she was anywhere near an end of life discussion and this was in the days before this was such a big topic mm -hmm. she said I want you to write that in the notes and so then we got into her advanced directives you know we're talking about this is there do you have a proxy and we were able to do advanced directives and then in terms of C community, she had friends that she hiked with. They did rituals together around like summer solstice, winter. Um, and and um, that was important to her. That just grounded her. And um, 
and it was an interesting conversation too because in her research background she said you know I'm a pretty hardcore researcher and yet this this kind of thing is really important for me it does it, it, it is who I am so that's that's an example um, we then went on for you know to talk about her her breast mass she did have one I was a little concerned about it it was hard it wasn't mobile um, so we talked about that and I recommended her to the breast center for an evaluation and possible biopsy and to get more information about that. Uh, we discussed some treatment um, options, but I'm not an oncologist nor a breast surgeon, so I really deferred most of that to my colleagues. Um, we talked about where she was emotionally with this. She was obviously afraid, but we, she, she was interested in meditation to deal with that. Uh, socially, she had good support systems, and then spiritually, I think that there was um, she, she had a lot of spiritual resources of strength, and that's what I highlighted in her note. And her interest in meditation, she really wanted to work with a teacher, so I gave her resources for that. So that's an example of someone where religion didn't really play a role. Mm -hmm. um, she wasn't it wasn't end of life. She actually did really well. Uh, ended up not being um, cancer, but uh, it just you know. For, in any kind of case, you can do that. She was relatively young. Now, another case is, um, so a patient who um, comes in um, is um, a man, male, he's 56, um, comes in because he's very thirsty and is urinating a lot um, at night. Um, it is someone I've seen before, so this is more of an acute visit, not, not a full history and physical. Um, so I ask him a lot about um, what's going on with him in terms of how often he's urinating at night. I ask all the, the, the sort of the review systems that I need with regard to that symptom. Um, and, uh, and then I ask about a family history, and he does have a family history of diabetes, a very strong family history of diabetes. So we, we do a finger stick in the office, and it is high, so we do talk about the fact that he probably does. I need to do some more tests. So then he gets very anxious with that diagnosis, and this is a sort of typical kind of visit where we're talking, but at the same time I'm able to get the finger stick while we're having that conversation, so it's still part of the history, but I have some additional information. So we're talking about that, and he really takes it really hard. He starts panicking, you know, that, you know, I have diabetes. This is horrible. Um, so I'm thinking, well, yes, but this is, could be early on. There's many treatments, and he says, yeah, but my uncle, you know, he had amputations. He ended up on dialysis. You know, he says, I'm an African-American, we know what happens, this is the history, I don't want that to happen to me, I don't want to go blind, I don't want this to happen, I'm terrified. And while I wanted to, and I did start to talk about early treatment and that, that there could be prevention, that's not where he was at all. So we went back, he said, well, yeah, I remember we talked about spirituality before, and where, where is that now, your spirituality in the midst of this, right now as we're talking about this. So he says, well... You know, because I, you know, I, you know, I'm Baptist, and that's important to me. And um, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, is, is it something that I did wrong? You know, he says I, I don't really pray maybe as much as I should. Is that why I'm getting this? You know, and a, a lot of discussions about that. So, um, you know, I asked, well, have you talked to your minister? You know, he says I don't really talk very much. I said, what about the community? He goes, well, I go, and you know, my wife drags me. I don't know that it really is that important to me. Is that why I'm sick? You know, and that was a really, um, and I certainly didn't answer that for him, but I saw that as an issue. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about that. I heard his story. I you know, listened more to what that meant to him. I, I was able to uh, then examine him, and then when we sat down together to develop a treatment plan together, I said, I think we need to get some more blood tests. What's your feeling, you know, depending on what the blood tests show, what's your feeling about medication? I, I, that was that point where I was able to explain to him how it would be good if we could treat this early and with regular finger stick monitoring, diet, he's overweight, that there's many ways that people can live a long time with this and not end up. It does not need to be your uncle's story. This is your story, not his. Let's create your story together. You know, we can do this together. Uh, and you can be a huge part of that. This is your story. Um, and then I, I said, you know, it's, it's interesting what you talk about your faith. and. I think working with a chaplain would be a great idea, and then I explain what chaplains do. They're not clergy, they're, they can be, they're not necessarily clergy, they work with people of different denominations, and they're very trained to look at spiritual beliefs in the context of 
illness? And he said, yeah, because I think I would like to do that. Now, I happen to know a chaplain that works in an outpatient setting, so uh, she's willing, she was willing at that time to see, um, to see someone, so I referred him to her. But he also said that he was thinking maybe would he be able to bring his clergy person to the office at some point. I said, I'd be totally open to that. Mm -hmm. So those are, again, two different types of examples. One where I think um, the issue of this is a punishment by God, we're tempted to say, oh, no, 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 it isn't, but that's not where that person was. And so while I listened to it, I did not attempt to change that. And I recognized that my chaplain colleagues could work more fully with that. So, and then clearly follow up, you know, with both of those patients, I've, you know, followed up all the time on these issues with them uh, and, and on their beliefs. And uh, in his case, I, I did find out what the chaplain how the chaplain worked with him, what that meant, and, and I documented some of that in the note. I think that's really important. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No, I think no. we've got it. Okay. Yeah. Is that good? <laughs>